So it seems we have um, seven, one nodding, uh, two uh, dating, um, one that would like to add someone else to the dating game, uh, and then two that are marriage, but one that's quite unhealthy. Um, I'd like to go back to this question I believe that Marie actually raised in her presentation, which is this whole idea of income being enough. And I, I think that you've actually proven again and again that we need more than just income to drive better nutrition um, practices, at least within the household. Um, Prabhu, I know you and I have had several conversations about that. Um, I'm wondering if you have thoughts about that statement. So I want to bring um, results just fresh off uh, from Cornell. Um, uh, our, one of our PhD students who just graduated this summer did her PhD thesis looking at this very question about what happens as you move from rice to a more commercialized production system, what happens to nutrition, and specifically what happens to the iron level, the uh, iron status of the women in the household. And she looked across a thousand households, uh, across a belt in southern Maharashtra, uh, all the way from rice to cotton to soybean growing households, and she did very intensive survey. She used the IFPRI Women's Empowerment Index, plus she did blood samples to look at the iron levels uh, in the blood. And her results show very strongly that as income rises, you see a significant change in diets and diet diversity, but, and this is a very significant but, but only when income rise is also associated with women's empowerment. Where you see both income and women's empowerment together, you see a dramatic change in diets and in overall health improvement of the women in the house. And that's through the hemoglobin levels in their blood. Where you don't have that women's empowerment, you don't see that effect. So that's the latest new result that's come out of our program, and that's what I want to put on the table. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so Mark, uh, you mentioned that finance is actually going to be one of the critical factors to keep the marriage going. Um, yet, I think plenty of studies are showing us, um, I guess the World Bank is saying something around $85 billion a year is going to be needed to feed the world. Uh, we can maybe find $7 billion um, from public coffers. Uh, how are we going to fill that gap? Yeah, I think that's the, the big question that a lot of people are, are looking at. I think those of us who were in Addis in the financing uh, uh, meeting before the, S the, uh, the UN began, and everyone was saying, well, all we need is new innovative financing models, and, but you know, ODA is going down, and innovative financing models will, will take it over. But if you actually unpack a lot of those innovative financing models, most of it most of them are IDA credits that are getting recycled, and there isn't that much real new money. And, I, and so I think that's, this is a big issue. And, and so certainly there's a, a view that we need to get more uh, governments to, you know, to invest more. It's, it's easier to say, particularly with the, the collapse of commodity prices where governments have to slash a lot of uh, you know, uh, their budgets right now because of that. So, you know, I, I think it's, it's a bit of a, a challenge, uh, and we have the climate agenda, and those of us in Europe are seeing all of ODA moving to uh, migration uh, from a number of donor countries. So I, th I think this, is, this is, the, is really the challenge. Where are we going to see a lot of the new kind of revenue? Because without investment backing some of this from national sources and, and, and donors, you know, uh, it's going to be very difficult. I mean, we hope Feed the Future continues because that's, that's really been the, one of the main sources. But, you know, there's some other initiatives from the Germans, others, but we don't yet see, a, you know, a huge new uh, amount of money coming. So uh, the private sector is a potential source. I mean, this is where certainly the nutrition community has been very reluctant to look at the private sector and the agriculture community. But... You go to some of the largest, uh, agri you know, uh, players in, in nutrition and food, they are in the private sector. We just haven't found a way of engaging them effectively or getting them to focus on, on uh, nutritious foods or diets in the way we want. So I think that's 
got to be part of how we look to fill the resource gap. Thank you, Mark. So I think you, um, I'd like to go back to this question. I, I think that um, we talked a little bit about how these two sectors sort of talk past one another. And this question of evidence base. Now I know Harvest Plus has invested a, an enormous amount of energy and even began the initial design making sure that it held the bar for nutrition where nutrition would dictate it needed to be. Um, enormous, enormous efforts to um, look at um, in vitro models, animal models, human models, efficacy, effectiveness, crop by crop, nutrient by nutrient. Clearly, I don't know that we can afford to do that because people don't eat crops and they don't eat nutrients, they do eat diets. So I'm wondering, maybe this is a question to is three of you, Francesco, Marie, and Howdy, how sustainable is it for us to keep the bar where nutrition will need it or currently defines what is an efficacious nutrition intervention and what else can we do to keep this marriage um, quite happy but not overburden it? Howdy, start with you. I think I, I should leave it to the nutrition community really to answer how, how high the, uh, the bar should be on, in terms of the evidence. We have done efficacy trials, uh, you know, controlled situations. We've, fro we've shown we can improve iron status, vitamin A status. We've done an affectionness study with, with the orange sweet potato. Um, I, think, I think we've pretty much established that, uh, that it, biofortified crops work. And it will be too big a job to replicate what we did on the orange sweet potato for all the other crops. We can, we can approximate some of those studies. But, but it's really up to, we need the support of the nutrition community. So it's up to them to tell us. And if we need more evidence, we'll generate it. Francesco. Now, on the evidence side, I, I totally agree. I think we, we now live in an, in an era of evidence-based uh, or evidence-informed, rather, uh, medicine, also evidence-informed policies. We do that all the time, and uh, we clearly have a lot of good information about what is healthy diet. We're able to say that with, uh, with uh, great certainty, and we also know what are the effective policies, which is also very important, because you know, we know what's going to change, and we, we can advise countries to uh, make the right choices and, and save on resources. So, so that's certainly the basis. But then the recipes are different. I mean, we have different food systems in the world, and uh, each food system has different needs. And we need to take different actions at different levels, whether it's the production, whether it's the transformation, whether it's the retail, whether it's the consumers. So, so that is needed. Uh, from, I think what we know is that uh, since there's this big discrepancy between the food supply and uh, the, the healthy diet, uh, we need to, to act a lot on the food supply. I think that what we have not worked enough on the food supply, examples, fruit and vegetables. I mean, fruit and vegetables have not, uh, uh, consumption has not grown in Africa. Why? Because there's very poor post-harvest management uh, of fruit and vegetables. Uh, fats and oils. Uh, if we are serious about reduction of saturated fat, why don't we work more on alternative crops to palm oil, which is the, the, the fat uh, which is cheapest? Animal source food. We need to find an alliance with the environment and perhaps think of a shift in the uh, availability between uh, the uh, countries and the parts of the world which have overconsumption, the parts of the world which have underconsumption. So I think this is the type of uh, uh, context based evidence that we need. Okay, context based evidence. Marie, do you, would you like? Um, from the nutrition point of view, and, and I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but I guess I have a point I'd like to make, is that from a nutrition point of view, life is not about agriculture and nutrition. Agriculture and nutrition is, is an artifact. There, there's a community out there which is called agriculture, which produces food and which has realized that food was important for nutrition once we had a, a big food price crisis. Um, but we, we need to continue to say repeatedly that agriculture is just not enough to improve nutrition. And, from, and when we come at it from a nutrition point of view, what we say or think or the, the vision we have is that nutrition has to be integrated everywhere in all of the other sectors. 
The example of women's empowerment improving nutrition or being the, the element that makes agriculture deliver on nutrition is excellent. Uh, there is the same similar argument with women's education. Uh, there is also the similar argument with, with uh, WASH. People need everything. Children and, and women need everything in order to have a better nutritional status. They need health, they need education, they need social protection, they, may, they need food, they need agriculture. But it's not just agriculture and nutrition, and, and we tend to narrow it down. And the first sector that has to deliver for us in nutrition is health. And we've worked with health a lot over time, but health is not even so nutrition sensitive or nutrition smart. And so our job from a nutrition point of view is to bring all the sectors along with us and, and find their role and find where they're going to help us to achieve these nutritional improvements as, as our ultimate goal. So in conclusion, agriculture is just part of what's going to work and help us. And so that marriage, I don't care if it's successful or not successful. I think the important part of it all was that we had to learn from each other. Agriculture had to learn from nutrition. We had to learn from how to work with agriculture. But at the end of the day, it's still not enough, and we need to bring all of the other sectors in. Sure, and it gets back to the whole, even the original UNICEF framework, food, health, and care. Um, Wolfgang, I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous. I'm a, a bit worried. We've had a, a quite a focus on agriculture and nutrition over the past five years, and actually, IFPRI's conference in 2011 kicked off quite the interest in this whole marriage. Um, I'm wondering, from your perspective, um, do we see this window staying open for very long um, of opportunity to work together, um, to be resourced to build this marriage? Do we see other things coming down the agenda that, will, that perhaps could trump this momentum that we've started? It does look a bit different now. We've got private sector at the table in some cases, bigger investment, but um, how nervous should we be that this window of opportunity is actually closing? Yeah, very, very good point, Bonnie. I mean, obviously, we, we always need to be aware if we don't deliver, you know, we might kind of fall back or be being pushed back into, um, into a marginal corner um, when other priorities take over. <clears throat> so I share that concern to a certain extent. But I, I also, I mean, if we look at, for instance, of the work of IFPRI over the last 20 years, I mean, obviously, research institutes, you know, NGOs, donors, have been dealing with that issue for quite a long time. That's why I mentioned the... Uh, the long honeymoon period. Um, and probably the issue is not so much, uh, are we making enough progress on things that we seem to, you know, know more or less what needs to happen and maybe having a good idea about what are the projects, what are the approaches, contextualized, of course, that do make a difference. I think every one of us, uh, research institutes, uh, NGOs, uh, corporates even, you know, can come up with a number of fairly successful projects and approaches, you know, there's no, there's no scarcity of that one. Now, are we, can we be content with that one? No, we can't, because we are obviously not changing the game to the extent that it is required. And, you know, as much as I personally do enjoy, you know, the progress that we have in conferences like this, I'm getting concerned with um, maybe the lack of difference that we're making on a big scale. And we had a discussion this morning over political will. You know, we, ha we are talking about political issues here. You know, when you talk about women's empowerment, it's not just about getting a few women into um, a better educated position. We're, we're talking about inequality. We're talking about very serious issues that need to be addressed, not just with technical expertise, but also with the political will. Now, it was said the political will is there because, for instance, African states have, you know, committed... Um, in the Maputo Declaration, a certain amount of their budget, but frankly, this is not, in, not, not, in, not good enough. The commitment is not good enough. It needs to happen. And, you know, we uh, as CARE uh, next week um, turn 70, uh, so one birthday child is supposed to congratulate the other birthday child. Um, but when you turn 70, you know, and you're not ready for retirement, then you get probably a little bit more impatient than when you turn 40. And being impatient at the, at the age of 70 basically means being impatient of the lack of political will. And I think Rajul in the, um, in the initial movie that was said, the video was, was shown, I think you showed Henry Kissinger in 1973, 1974, saying, you know, in 10 years' time, no child needs to go to bed hungry. 10 years prior to that, John F. Kennedy, as we all know, opened that, you know, 
first World Food Congress in, in 1963, saying we have the means, we have the tools, we have the knowledge to eradicate hunger. We don't have the political will. Now, if we listen to a statement like that today, what has changed? So I think we need to address that as well, as much as we need to address the, um, the marriage of uh, nutrition and agriculture. Thanks. Um, thank you, Prabhu. Um, we will, you can have the last word on the panel. So um, I've been critical looking at the situation today and looking at the past. But when I look at the future, I'm really optimistic. And the reason I'm optimistic is demands are changing dramatically. The demand for rice and the other staples is dropping at the per capita level across much of the emerging economies and much of the developing world. And the demand for diet diversity is increasing. And as the demand for diet diversity increases, you will essentially see the supply response of a much more diversified food supply system if the agriculture policy corrects itself to make it a level playing field. And if that happens, I think the future is much more positive in terms of a, a much closer relationship between food systems, uh, agriculture, and nutrition. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhu. So I'm told that this interesting conversation, we're um, actually not going to go to the floor, um, but I'm sure all the panelists are available. Um, for discussion. Um, we're going to close with a one-minute statement um, from each of the panelists in the last words you might like to leave yeah, um, with everyone. Um, and, and so I see people furiously writing down their one minute. Um, so I guess, Marie, I'd like to start with you. Um, in the end, um, this marriage between agriculture and nutrition, I, I very hear you very clearly. It's, it's not really whether a marriage is working, but it, whether we're able to integrate nutrition through the whole process. So here's your minute. Okay. Yeah, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to end on a positive note about the marriage. Um, in the 1990s, when I visited the centers to discuss the possibility of biofortification, the, the breeders didn't really want to hear about having to breed for another breeding objective. They, nutrition was for the nutritionists to take care of. That wasn't their job as plant breeders. And when I talked to nutrition donors about giving money to an agricultural research institute, that was, that was a non-starter. That just didn't, wasn't a possibility. Um, two weeks ago, I was in Nigeria at the first annual Nutritious Food Fair. Um, we have, we have biofortified cassava, yellow cassava. We hired Paul Alona as our country manager. He was a breeder at IITA, cassava breeder, did a lot of work on cassava extension. He's trying to figure out how to popularize yellow cassava. He went to Nollywood. He convinced the producers and the actors there's now a full-length feature, yellow cassava, out in movie theaters in Nigeria. And at the, at the food fair, at the nutritious food fair in Abuja, those, those uh, movie personalities came and they were the moderators for all the activities at the nutritious food fair. Paul went around to state governments and established uh, nutrition quiz contests among high schools in different states. And then the state winners came to Abuja and competed in a national competition. And they're going to they're gonna make this an annual event, move it from city to city in Nigeria. And he wants every state in Nigeria to have these contests and send representatives. So this is somebody who was a, who was a breeder and now has really taken nutrition on board. So, <clears throat> well... My final message is that uh, I'd like to use the value chain approach. We've learned it from, from Marie. Uh, I would like to see that uh, nutrition and health are a value that agriculture and the food system increase at every step of the chain. And uh, I would like to take inspiration from the sustainable development goals, which are global goals and they call for a reduction in all forms of malnutrition. And if you're serious about that, then I hope that uh, we will have uh, 10 years sustained action to implement the uh, framework for action, the agreed commitments of the ICN2, and we will see that the food supply 
is providing the nutrient uh, that all the people need at all stages of the life course in all settings. So that's something we, which seems very difficult to achieve, but it's something we can achieve. Thank you. Thank you. We'll just keep, keep going down. Myself? Yes, please. Okay, thanks. Yeah, very little to add. I mean, I am excited about the window that we have, and you mentioned it, Bonnie. I think it's a great opportunity, uh, especially as we have so much kind of cross-sectoral cooperation here, but also between, you know, the research uh, uh, com science com community, uh, the implementers, the corporate sector, some of the big donors. So it's a fantastic opportunity. I think we need to make sure that we get, that we get and keep everyone on board, because everyone matters, and that we focus on the most vulnerable, um, that one we must not forget. I mean, the most vulnerable are those who suffer from malnutrition and hunger. And it is not just, it is not about feeding the planet, you know, I'm always getting very uncomfortable with, uh, with this statement, but it is about capacitating people, about making sure that people are able to get themselves out of misery. So we do have that opportunity, uh, and uh, I think we at CARE are game, thanks. Shall I start? Yes, no. yes. Okay. So my final message is, um, as a community, uh, let's get beyond doing small projects that show agriculture and nutrition can work together, projects that don't scale. But rather, as a community, let's look at reforming policies that are in place that prevent agriculture from contributing to nutrition. So looking at agriculture policy and the way that agriculture policy can promote a more diversified food supply system, but also looking at multisectoral policies that can contribute along with agriculture to nutrition outcomes, water, sanitation, overall childcare, women's empowerment policies, et cetera. So let's, let's focus our efforts at a higher level and reach scale through policy change. Yeah, well, I, I think the, you know, the, the future, I think, does look more, more positive. I think there is a lot more awareness, and it's increasing. Global Nutrition Report's a big part of that work of IFPRI has helped. And I think this is leading to much more targeted advocacy. We've already seen in this country changes in the food system because of that advocacy. But I also think we need to be thinking of the food system of the future. And you know, two thirds of the people are gonna be living in cities. And I've just come from a meeting where, where mayors of a number of the biggest cities are starting to think of, to prevent, here they're thinking of preventing type two diabetes dri driven by obesity. They're thinking, how are we going to shape the food system with, given that we have all these problems and to take and they're starting to say let's take control of that food system and try and drive it to get the kind of outcomes we want to have so we're not just receiving the impacts without you know changing so that's me thanks thanks mark marie i'll get my minute back um, I, I am also very worried about losing the momentum especially for agriculture and nutrition uh, and I think the best way we can lose it is if we don't hurry up and show evidence that it works and how it works and that we have lessons that can be applied and, and replicated and, and uh, innovation is, is allowed. Um, so I think that the role of the small projects that uh, Prabhu was, was talking was to show a proof of concept and we still have very little of that. And once we know it works, then we will keep our momentum and the scale up will make sense. Thank you everyone. Um, happy birthday, IFPRI. Um, I'd like to just see, tell you a bit about what I was hearing. Um, I'd like to maybe even mention going back to Peter Timmer. I mean, Peter was sitting on a panel prior to this and he was the first person I thought that added the consumer to the dialogue and the discussion. And I think this is enormously important to really understand the demand side that's gonna pull nutrition into agriculture. Um, I, I'm hearing that um, there are enormous opportunities along the value chain. 
I'm hearing that there are policy barriers that we should be looking at and seeing if we can take away some of those obstacles. Um, and that political will still remains a big question mark. We've been here before. Many of us in this room have been here before. Um, that the future of the food system itself, and food system seems to be coming into the dialogue much more than just agriculture, recognizing that foods move off farm and we're going to have to feed those cities with an adequate diet. So I'd like to thank you all um, and please let's continue the conversation in the hallways over coffee. Um, thank you, panelists.